اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اما بعد سبحان کلا علم لنا اللہ معلم تنا ان کا انت علیم الحکیم ربی شرح علی صدری و یسر علی عمری وحل العقد تم السان یف کہوں قولی ربی یسر ولا تو اسر و تمم ہو لنا بالخیر یا فتح ہو یا فتح ہو یا فتح ان شاء اللہ بفور وی بگن دا پروگرام وی آئی سو ہاف از مصطفیٰ اوہ تینس الحمد للہ وی ہاف سم ریسائٹیشن دا قرآن ان شاء اللہ أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا إذا جاءكم فاسق بنبأ بنبأ فتبينوا أن تصيبوا قوما بجهالة قوما بجهالة فتصبحوا على ما فعلتم نادمين واعلموا أن فيكم رسول الله لو يطيعكم في كثير من الأمر لعنتم ولكن الله حبب ولكن الله حبب إليكم الكفر والفسوق والعصيان أولئك هم الراشدون فضلا من الله ونعمه والله عليم حكيم صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله خيرا نعم بسم مصطفى for the beautiful recitation of the Quran May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala connect our hearts, unite our hearts with the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable us to understand the Qur'an itself and practice this and implement that within our lives. And indeed, my dear respected brothers and elders and sisters in Islam, it is an immense mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that who allows each and every one of us to come towards His house and the masajid. Indeed, the masajid are the houses of Allah. And those who come within this masjid or the houses of Allah, they are in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us and gives us and grants this ability to each and every one of us. Indeed, it is an immense mercy and blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for which we should be thankful to. Alhamdulillah, over the, over the past few months, we have been covering the lives of Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in in this particular week. And as we know that the life of Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in is so precious, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself mentions in the Qur'an radiyallahu anhum wa radu'an that indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the excellence and the greatness of sahaba radiyallahu anhum ajma'in itself has been mentioned in the Qur'an to an extent that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the people the guideline of bringing iman and Islam Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the sahaba the base of iman and Islam for the humanity as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an, آمَنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ Bring iman like the people brought iman. آمَنَ النَّاسِ According to all the mufassireen, an-nas in this ayat of the Qur'an means as-sahaba. Bring iman like the sahaba brought iman. Bring your lives towards the way of truthfulness like the sahaba brought. So the criteria of the success of individuals and humanities Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it to be the life of Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the best of the individuals to become the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
to an extent that the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha reports in Sahih al-Muslim that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says khayr al-quruni qarni thumma alladheena yalunahum and some rewild says thumma alladheena yalunahum that indeed the best time and the era in the humanity and the time of its existence is the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then afterwards it's the time when these individuals who are alive in the state of Iman and they saw Sahaba, meaning the Tabi'een. And then some riwayat even says, Taba Tabi'een, those who had seen Tabi'een in the state of Iman and passed away. Indeed, this is the best time according to the hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu So the best of the individuals, the best of the time that Allah had given. And now in reality, the life of these individuals are the best example for each and every one of us. For us to look up to someone. Or, or to follow and imitate someone, with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in's life is the best. Few days back, while well, you know, few occasions were going on in the culture and society, I was speaking to some of our youngsters, and I, you know, I was mentioning to them that what is imitation, and not imitation according to Islam, Sunnah, the life of the Prophet sallam, just imitation. According to the street translation of imitation, imitation means when a person imitates someone, they begin to praise an individual to, an, to a highest extent. When you praise an individual to the highest extent, you begin to imitate them. You praise an individual to an extent that you begin to imitate them. But the translation of imitation is when a person becomes a mental slave of whatever others are doing that I have to do. Imitation. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, if one wants to imitate and be like someone, then look at the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And look at the life of Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een who were the true role models for us. Today we have made many people our role models. The people that we look up to, the styles that we look up to, the traits and characteristics that we look up to. But no one looks up to the life of those individuals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose for the companionship of Rasulullah Those individuals whose beauty and whose greatness Allah mentions in the Qur'an, whose names the Prophet mentioned as this will be in Jannah and that will be in Jannah. And the virtues of these individuals were so great that the verses of the Qur'an were being revealed for these individuals. So amongst the life of Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een over the past months and years so, we have been covering alhamdulillah many Sahaba and today the Sahabi that we get to is the Sahabi who is famous for the name known as Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. The name Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu for those who know history, who might be connected to the history of Islam, might give to be the greatest host of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whenever a person should hear a name of a Sahabi, something should click in their mind about this individual. We should be so connected with a Sahaba that when you hear the name of a Sahabi, there should be something which comes in our mind. For example, if you hear the name of Abu Huraira, then at least something should come from his life. Like last month we covered, at least something. For example, the, narr the most narrator of the hadith of Rasulullah wasallam, A person who lived the shortest time but narrated the most hadith. So every Sahabi and individual that we learn about, we should try to learn in such a way that when we hear the name of this individual, the entire life should come in front of us, should become visible. So how we can bring these individuals' life within our lives as well. Today, as for our youngsters who are present here, if we were to speak the names of celebrities, superstars according to the sports, different you know, criteria, as soon as you say the name, a person will define the name, even the sports team, even the, you know, some of the kids will even mention the stats. How many losses? How many wins? Who are they playing today? Who they played yesterday? Who they will be playing yesterday? What's the best trade that they have to do for this season in the draft? Everything will be mentioned by the name of one individual. But the, the life of Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in, which we need to also encourage and bring forth within our lives and the lives of our families as well. The name Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, his name, even though as we know, I mentioned this many times as well, the name Abu Ayyub is from a kunyat, a relationship that a person has through a certain trait or through their awlad and their children. 
So he was known as the father of Ayyub. His wife was known as Umm Ayyub. The name of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was Khalid. The name of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, many of us might not have never, ever known. But the name of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was Khalid. And the name was Khalid bin Zayd ibn Khulayb. And he was from the people and the tribe of Banu Najjar. Banu Najjar are those individuals who are from the family of the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If you remember and recall the, the incident of the hijrah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or even before that, when the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa occurred, when we spoke about that at the, at the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa briefly, the mother Amina, the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, <clears throat> she was taking Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while he was a, chi a child to a city known as Yathrib, which later became Medina. And the reason why she was taking this child to Medina, Yathrib, which was at that time, the reason was that all of her families, her mom, her dad, parents, brothers, they used to be in Yathrib from the tribe of Banu Najjar. So in reality, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, if you go back to the lineage of it, he was from the tribe of Banu Najjar, from which the same tribe was the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as well. And of course, we know the incident when the mother of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away at a location known as Abuwa. The Prophet sallallahu was brought back towards Mecca and he could not complete the journey at that time. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu is from the tribe of Banu Najjar which is located amongst the people of Medina. Regarding the Islam of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, there is a difference of opinion. According to the narrations, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was born in year 570, approximately six years after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we calculate the years of the age of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, and as we know that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made hijrah from Makkah towards Medina, the age of Rasulullah sallallahu was 53. The age of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at the Nabuah was 40. He lived for 13 more years in Makkah, which makes it 53. And at this age, he made hijrah towards Medina. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was approximately 47 years of age when he was the one who hosted Rasulullah sallallahu in Madinatul Munawwara. The Islam spread in Medina through few reasons and through few people. As we know that the first effort of the Prophet sallallahu of the da'wah and propagation of Islam was in Makkatul Mukarramah. For 13 years he tried conveying the people, messages even to Abyssinia, people did not accept the year when Rasulullah lost his uncle, the Prophet lost his wife, the Prophet went towards the Mi'raj, the Prophet came back. Then the Prophet was met by a few individuals from Medina at the time of Hajj. This was the time in which Rasulullah gave da'wah to the people of Medina and few people, eight men and two women, one narration, six men and two women from Medina, the tribes of Aws and Khazraj accepted Islam on the hand of Rasulullah two years before his hijrah. These individuals went back and they started the propagation of Iman and Islam. And the next year, many more people came and accepted Islam on the head of Rasulullah And the following year, the Prophet made hijrah. So according to some of the people of tarikh and history, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari had accepted Islam about during that time even before hijrah or right at the time when the hijrah was beginning or before Rasulullah had even decided and the revelation had not come to leave Medina. So the time frame of Islam of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari is approximately 45 to 47 years of age when he accepted Islam. And this is, this is the time when Islam started to begin in Madinatul Munawwara. As we know, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reached, he left Makkatul Mukarramah when he reached and he was destining and he was planning to go towards Madinatul Munawwara before he entered this, the sacred and the holy city of Medina, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stopped by in a neighboring locality known as Quba. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam stayed there for 14 days, two weeks, 
Within this time, the Prophet ﷺ made the foundation of the first masjid in Islam in which Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 108, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself praises the foundations of this masjid in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that this masjid is built on the foundations of taqwa and piety. That Allah praises the foundations of the Masjid of Quba, that it was built upon taqwa and piety, which Rasulullah laid the foundation for the 14 days he was staying within the premises of Quba. Prophet ﷺ left Quba after 14 days. He performed the first Jummah Salah in Islam in an open ground before entering Medina. While he was entering Medina, the Prophet ﷺ was sitting upon his camel and the name of the camel of Rasulullah was known as Qaswa. This was the name of the camel of Rasulullah to an extent that historians have even saved even the name which Rasulullah gave to his camel. While the Prophet ﷺ was entering Medina, all the leaders and the tribemen and the individual people from around the area of Medina started to gather around the camel of Rasulullah ﷺ, wishing and wanting the Prophet ﷺ to come and stay over, his, over their house. And they wanted to become those individuals who can be honored by the Prophet ﷺ and be graced by the coming of the Prophet ﷺ and they can host the Prophet ﷺ. At this moment, the Prophet ﷺ made an announcement and he says, leave my camel alone. This camel qaswa is underneath the divine revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wherever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants and has destined this camel to reach, it will reach so you do not touch this. As the camel was moving to the places in Madinatul Munawwara, all the chieftains and all the leaders, the desire was growing within their heart that they wished that the honorable guest Rasulullah could be in their house. But as they say, the time continued. And as soon as the camel walked in front of the house, the people broke their hearts that they will not be able to host the Prophet ﷺ. And the people in the future further houses, they began to increase their hopes that the Nabi of Allah ﷺ will come within our house. The camel of the Prophet ﷺ continuously moved. No one touched it. And the camel finally stopped at an open location, which was an empty lot. The Prophet ﷺ's camel stopped at an empty lot which had nothing built upon it and no one lived in this, in this specific area. The house which was right in front of this place, meaning the, the empty lot, this was the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. Which Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu knew that if the camel has stopped in this empty lot and there is no one around this house, so that means the Nabi of Allah is my guest. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu said that this day was the most precious day that in which I considered the greatest treasure of this world was given to me that the Prophet sallallahu became my guest and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the Nabi of Allah to become the guest of mine and I can become the host of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa camel stopped in a specific location. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not take and did not come out off of the camel at this moment and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loosened the reins while he was holding the reins of, of his animal the Prophet ﷺ let it go the camel began to move and it came back to its own location in which Rasulullah ﷺ says this is the place where the masjid and the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be built for those brothers and sisters who have seen Madinatul Munawwara the masjid of Rasulullah ﷺ is situated and located at that same location where the camel of Rasulullah ﷺ was seated at that time. And this became the place where the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was built afterwards. The Prophet ﷺ called and asked for the owners of this place, two young boys, Mu'az and Mu'awwaz, according to one narration. These two kids were brought. They were the owners of this land, but because they were not mature enough to make decision, a Sahabi who used to be the guardian of these individuals, two kids, he was brought and the Prophet ﷺ asked him for how much will he give this land. The Prophet ﷺ was told that, Oh Nabi of Allah, this is for you. You can take it for free to make the masjid. The Prophet ﷺ says, we will not take it for free. 
It is not the right and the haq that we should take it like this. And then the Prophet ﷺ asked for the price. And then 10 dinars was made the price of that land. And Abu Bakr as-Siddiq who is the person who gave the entire masjid, entire masjid, the entire money to get that place for the Prophet ﷺ. While this place was confirmed, the Prophet ﷺ became the host of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari anhu, which was the neighbor of that empty lot. The Prophet ﷺ for the next seven months stayed in the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari anhu while the masjid of Rasulullah ﷺ was being constructed. So it took about seven months to construct the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ along with the chambers and the rooms which were connected with the Prophet ﷺ himself stayed with his family and his azwaj afterwards. As soon as the Prophet ﷺ was about to enter the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu says, I carried the luggage and the baggage of the Prophet ﷺ, considering it to be the greatest honor that anyone can have to bring forth the Nabi of Allah inside his house. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu said, he had two stories of his house. There were two floors to the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. He asked the Prophet ﷺ that we have emptied the entire top floor of the house we have moved our families and our children and we want you to stay on the top of the house at this moment the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam preferred to stay at the bottom of the house and the sahaba the rasulullah sallallahu says because excessive amount of sahaba will keep on coming and meeting the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam because he just came inside the city of medina so he would prefer to stay at the bottom and then he would become and he can greet the people and the sahaba can come and meet the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam at this location Abu Ayyub al-Ansari says, the Prophet ﷺ was settled on the first portion of our house. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari says, me and my wife, which was known as Umm Ayyub, we went on top of the house. As soon as they were settled on the top, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari screamed out and said, O oh, Umm Ayyub, may we be destroyed. She asked what happened, O oh, Abu Ayyub. She says, how can it be? that the Nabi of Allah stays beneath us and we are on top of him. How can it ever be that the Nabi of Allah be beneath us and we are on top? So they came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they requested and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Oh Abu Ayyub, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your decisions and knows your intentions and Allah knows the purity of your heart that you are not doing this for any disobedience but you are giving it to give preferences to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam but he stayed there in his location. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu alayhi wa says, Next day while we were situated on the second floor of our house, a pot, a, a jug of water was, it fell from my wife and it began to seep down towards the first floor of the house where the Prophet ﷺ was. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu says, Fawallahi, at this moment we only had one blanket for which both of us used to sleep and cover ourselves at that time. And we had nothing else to do so, but we quickly ran and put this on the water so it can absorb and the Prophet ﷺ should not get hurt by anything or disturbance should be caused to the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari said, we used to walk on the edge of our house so we should never walk in any place where the Prophet ﷺ might be beneath us. This was the love that the Sahaba had for the Prophet ﷺ. Brothers and elders and sisters in Islam, it's easy to say from our tongues that we love the Prophet wasallam. It's easy to say that this is the sunnah of the Prophet. Oh, this is my Nabi. Oh, this is my Prophet. But it is very difficult to practically show this within our lives, that how much the love of the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is within our lives. So at this moment, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari says, we could not handle this anymore. We came to the Prophet wasallam said, and we said, O Nabi of Allah, even though your preferences is this, but we will not be able to stay on top of you. We do not want to become any hesitation in which we can cause any disturbance and any, you know, any disrespect to the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet wasallam at this moment moved towards the upper portion of the house of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. Amongst the many sifat and the qualities which have been mentioned ulama have mentioned that there are few verses of the quran which are revealed for sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in and specifically for their action and amongst that is abu ayyub al-ansari radiallahu anhu as well 
Ulama have mentioned that this ayat of the Quran وَيُثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خصاصة. The meaning of this ayat of the Quran is that they give preferences to others over their needs even though they need it the utmost themselves. Even though they need it the most themselves, but they give preferences to others over their needs. Ulama have mentioned this verse of the Quran has many reasons of revelation. For amongst them, one of them is for Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu, according to some of the scholars. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani rahmatullahi mentions in his book that once when the Prophet sallallahu masjid was complete, the Prophet sallallahu had few guests come over in the masjid. The Prophet sallallahu called for within his household, asked them if there is anything to eat. Nothing was present in the houses of the Prophet sallallahu So he made an open announcement in the masjid. That who will take my guest to be their guest tonight in their house? Who will keep my guest in their house? Feed them, make them stay there. Who will treat my guest to be their guest tonight? So the hadith in the narration says, One Ansari Sahabi. One Sahabi from Medina, the Ansar. And Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani rahmatullahi mentions his name was Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anh, said, O Nabi of Allah, I will take your guest to be my guest. He took the guest of Rasulullah ﷺ towards the house. He asked Umm Ayyub, is there anything to eat in the house? So she replied back by saying, we have only enough food which is sufficient for the children to eat. There is not enough food to give to everyone. So Abu Ayyub al-Ansari says, he is the guest of, of the Nabi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make the children go to sleep without any food. And when I'm about to serve the food to my guest, I will pretend that I'm fixing the lamp and the light and I will close it accidentally and I will make my guest eat and I will pretend that I'm eating. When the light and the lamp is closed and shut, he will not be able to know that if I ate anything or not. So he can eat to the fullest even though we can stay hungry for one night for the guest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He came back home, the children went to sleep without any food, the food is placed, the light is closed, the guest eats to his fullest. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and his wife and his children spend the entire night hungry and thirsty. The next morning, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and the guests, they are walking inside the masjid for Fajr Salah. The Prophet ﷺ looks at Abu Ayyub al-Ansari and smiles at him and says, Oh Abu Ayyub, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looked at your actions last night. And Allah is pleased with you. And He has mentioned, وَيُوثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصَاصًا O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, amongst your companions and there are individuals who give preferences to others over their own needs, even though they need it the most themselves. So the ayat of the Qur'an revealed for an individual of so much hospitality and given for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is another famous incident mention of the life of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu that we mentioned in the life of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. But just a recap on that. One day, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left the premises of his house. The Prophet sallallahu was extremely thirsty. The Prophet sallallahu was extremely hungry. He did not have anything to eat. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could not withhold the, you know, the heat in the house so he stepped outside to take a walk. He walked outside and he saw Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu and said, Oh Abu Bakr, what causes you to be outside in such heat? He said, Ya Nabi Allah, there is no food in my house. Because of the heat and hunger, I could not sit in my house. They started walking and they saw Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu and he said, Oh Umar, what are you doing? It's extremely hot outside. Ya Nabi Allah, there is no food in the house because of extreme hunger and extreme heat. I cannot sit in the premises of my house. And the Prophet says, Let's go to Abu Ayyub al Ansari. Such beautiful relationship between them that for seven years, they were seven months while the Prophet was living inside their house. They became so close that the Prophet said, Let's go to the house of Abu Ayyub al Ansari. The Prophet walked inside and asked, Where is Abu? Ayyub. So Umm Ayyub says that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari who is working in the gardens nearby and as soon as he heard the voice of the Prophet Abu Ayyub al-Ansari who came running and he said Oh Nabi of Allah sit and I want to feed you and the guests who have come with you. And Abu Ayyub al-Ansari who ran towards the garden he broke the dates some were ripe some were unripe and he put it in front of the Prophet He took out the water from the cold well and said Ya Nabi Allah enjoy the water enjoy the dates and I will bring some food for you. I will sacrifice a goat and my, my wife will make some bread for you so you can eat. 
At this moment, Rasulullah Sallallahu said, Oh Abu Ayyub, why did you break the dates which were unripe? Why did you break this? So he says, Ya Nabi Allah, taste this. This has his own taste. This has his own taste. So both of them have their own taste. Ya Nabi Allah, enjoy the both tastes. And then he went. And then when he was leaving, the Rasulullah Sallallahu said, Oh Abu Ayyub, do not sacrifice the goat which gives you milk. Just sacrifice a goat which is small. So you do not have to, to sacrifice that goat which you are receiving milk from. So he went and he sacrificed the goat. He made half of it into a shape of tharid with little bit of curry and meat inside and half of the meat he grilled for the Prophet Sallallahu and then he went and he told his wife to make the bread while everything was prepared it was presented in front of the Prophet Sallallahu while the food was about to start the Prophet Sallallahu took a loaf of bread and the Prophet Sallallahu took a piece of meat and the Prophet Sallallahu wrapped it around that loaf of meat and he handed over to Abu Ayyub al-Ansari. And he said, Oh Abu Ayyub, go and give this to my daughter Fatima. Because for days, my daughters and, and his son and his husband, have, her husband have not eaten anything. Oh my daughter, go. Oh, oh Ayyub, go. Abu Ayyub, go and give this to my daughter. Because she has not eaten in days. And this is the household of that woman in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the woman and the leader of all the women of Jannah is Fatima radiallahu anha. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Sayyada shabab ahli al-Jannah, Hassan wal Hussein. This is the house of those two youngsters who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said are the leaders of the youngsters of Jannah. The standards what we have kept for success and the standards which were in the sight of the Nabi of Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala were totally different. Today we have kept ourselves to another level. But if we look at the life of Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een, and we look at the life of the simplicity of these individuals, wallahi brothers and elders and sisters in Islam, these were the true successful individuals in which the Nabi of Allah says, O oh Abu Ayyub, go and give this piece of meat and give this piece of bread to my daughter because she has not eaten in days. This was the life that these individuals lived. And this was the success that Allah gave them because Allah gave them the contentment of their heart. Wallahi, today we might have everything in this world, but we might not have the contentment of the heart which Allah gives because of deen in the lives of individuals and which Allah had granted these individuals. And tears began to flow from the eyes of the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ said, O oh, Abu Bakr, O oh, Umar, on the day of judgment, indeed, each and every one of us will be questioned for the ni'mats that we have been given. The dates, the water, the meat, the bread, each and everything of this, Allah will question us that Allah gave us this ni'mat. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu and Umar radiallahu anhu said, Ya Nabi Allah, it's been days that we didn't eat. It's been days that we didn't eat. Will we be questioned for even this? Rasulullah sallallahu says, yes. But if you read this dua after eating, you will not be questioned for your food. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, if you read Alhamdulillahi alladhi huwa ashbana wa arwana wa an'ama alayna wa afdala, anyone who reads this dua after eating their food, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, they will not be questioned for the ni'mat of the food that Allah had given them. Because they have praised and thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. So he says, recite Alhamdulillahi alladhi huwa ashbana wa arwana wa an'ama alayna wa afdala. All praise be to our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who gave us food to eat, clothing to wear, and many blessings that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted us. The life of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu is famous for his hospitality and being the greatest host of the Prophet ﷺ, but it does not end there. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu in his life in general was not only a person who hosted the Prophet ﷺ, but he lived his life as a person of multi, you know, uh, efforts and, and greatness inside of him. Amongst them was he was a great warrior. 
to an extent that when we will speak about the demise and the death of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari in a few minutes, we will be finishing shortly in a few minutes when we will discuss the demise and the death of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari we will realize that how great of a warrior was Abu Ayyub al-Ansari He was also the katib and the scribe of revelation. He compiled the verses of the Qur'an and the ayats of the Qur'an which were given to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was also the vice-garant, meaning he was also the caretaker of the ummah at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu when he had left Medina. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was given the great responsibility of taking care and becoming the leader of the Muslims in Medina. He was also a reporter of hadith to an extent that it has been mentioned that Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu traveled from Medina all the way towards Egypt, Misr. Around that area, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu traveled for one hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to receive one narration that he heard that a sahabi had heard and he moved towards this area. He traveled all that distance to narrate one hadith and to get one ayah, one saying of the Prophet sallallahu So he's amongst the narrators of the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he's amongst the faqih. He's amongst the jurists of the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu that his fatawa were trusted and his verdicts were trusted amongst the people of Medina. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari is the Imam of the Masjid of Rasulullah Sallallahu at the time of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu when he was captured and when he was not allowed to leave his, the premises of his house, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu was the person who was the Imam of the Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was a father which was just to an extent that in an army, his son had killed an enemy in a way which was a very torturous way. And in front of the entire Medina, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was the one who became angry and gave haq to the enemy, that this was the haq of this person. So he was also a great fatherly figure. And he was also a great warner to an extent that whenever he saw anything leaving the life of the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he would warn against them to an extent that anyone, even the leaders of the time, if they were to say anything against the way of the Prophet وسلم, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was the first one to be raised at the time of Marwan ibn Hakam who was the governor of Medina when he began to say something against the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, at this moment Abu Ayyub al-Ansari was the first one to stand up and says that this is nothing will continue in Medina, which has ever been done against the way of the Prophet wasallam. So was, he was a great warner against the people as well, that he stopped them from anything that they were doing against the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. These were just the glimpses of the life of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu. The life of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu lasted according to some narrations, according to historians, he was in his mid-80s when the last days of the life of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu came. According to some narrations, he was in his mid-90s when the last days of the life of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu came upon him. What was the time and what was the days? According to the sayings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the city of Kansantolopal, which is the area near Turkey, this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave the glad tidings that will become victorious in the hands of the Muslims. And there will be a group of Muslims who will be loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with them will be a great army who will go and conquer this area. <coughs> so Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu well, he was in his mid-80s according to one narration. According to one narration, he had reached his mid-90s. He started this journey and he joined the army of the Muslims to go to the area of Constantinople. As Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was traveling towards his journey, he became extremely tired. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was also very sick at the moment. And at this moment, it prevented him from continuing his journey further. The army had taken the first siege and they had almost finished the army. But now the second siege and second attack needed to be made for the entire area to become open and successful for the believers. At this moment, when Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu became extremely sick and ill, and the last wish from the tongue of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was that when the Muslims gather around him and says, do you need anything, O Ayyub? 
So the words of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu was <coughs> that convey my salam to the Muslims or Muslim army. And he says, and I say, that tell them that Ayyub, Abu Ayyub has urged you to penetrate deeply within the premises which is meant for us. And even if I die in this location, carry my body and bury me in the walls of Kenton Teropo so I can be raised <coughs> as amongst those individuals who make this area victorious for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> According to the historians, while this journey and this army was continuing towards the area of Turkey, Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu before Istanbul passed away. To an extent that one narration says six days and seven nights. And some says seven nights and six days. The body of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu walked in the path of Allah, was carried in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he passed away, was when he was about to pass away, when he had ordained that do not bury me in this location, continue with my body and carry it. So the people said, why shouldn't we bury you in this location? So he says that I want to stand up in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I want to say this, that oh Allah, when I was alive, when I was young, I strived in your paths. When I became old, I strived in your paths. And even when my life had left and I had died, my body also strived in his path. So this can become the reasons of my intercession on the day of judgment. So for six days and seven nights, or one narration, seven nights and six days, the body of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu was continuously taken there. And of course, in the year 674, according to the, the years that we are following, this was the year when Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu passed away. And this was the time when he was buried at that specific location. And even for those brothers and sisters who have gone to Istanbul and Turkey, they can even go at this moment and see the exact places where Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu is buried at this time. Again, to conclude, my dear respected brothers and elders and sisters in Islam, over the time period of many months, we have covered the life of many Sahaba. But the reason behind covering these Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in is just not to learn new stories, new things, but in reality to learn the life of these individuals and try to practice and, and, and you know, present these things into our life. To an extent that the life of Sahaba should give us the love of Rasulullah sallallahu in our lives. It says Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu anhu's love for Rasulullah sallallahu was so great that once the Prophet sallallahu was walking between Safa and Marwa, the bird came and the feather fell upon the Prophet sallallahu So he rushed and he said, O Nabi of Allah, forget about the swords. Even if a, if, if a feather was to land upon you, I would sacrifice my life to save you from anything which the Prophet sallallahu did not like. And he cleaned it. And then the Prophet sallallahu said, O Abu Ayyub, from this day nothing will harm you until the death comes upon you. So meaning this was the love that these individuals gave to Rasulullah and practically showed within their life that how great was the honor and the love of the Prophet within their lives. So to conclude this, my dear respected brothers and elders and sisters in Islam, we should also learn the life of the Sahaba, try to go over the life of the Sahaba and try to read this along with our children in our houses so this becomes common in our houses that the life of Sahaba and the life of these beautiful individuals are continuously spoken in our environment that they can come within our lives. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to practice this inshallah and bring the life of Sahaba radiallahu anhum within our lives inshallah. If the brothers and the sisters have any questions inshallah we can take so at this time. Sure. Sure. Alhamdulillah, الذي أطعمنا وسقانا وجعلنا من المسلمين or وجعلنا من المسلمين is definitely a dua proven in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of eating. That it is amongst the etiquettes in the dua that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to pray and make this. But this dua has its own significance, meaning there are many duas of suffer and travel, right? So every dua has its own significance. So amongst the significance of the dua of this is that a person will have no hisab on the day of Qiyamah for whatever they eat. 
Yes, the dua is definitely there. There's another dua when a person goes to a da'wat and eats at someone else's house. Then you read the dua and you say, you know what? Allahumma atimana tamini wa skiyan saqani aqlatu amakum al-barar wa sallat alaykum al-malaika wa aftara indakum al-sa'imun. These are all the duas which have been proven, but everything with, with its own significance. Inshallah, next week we will continue the series of stories of Qur'an and the next week's topic for our stories of Qur'an is the story of Gog and Magog, which is known as Yajuj wal Ma'juj. Amongst the signs of the day of Qiyamah, these questions come up amongst you know, our families, sometimes in our gatherings, sometimes amongst the youngsters, that what are Gog and Magog, what is Yajuj and Ma'juj, when are they coming, what are some of the signs, what are the sayings of the Prophet ﷺ, what are the signs of the day of judgment which will relate towards this inshallah. So this is a topic that we will be covering next week inshallah. For those who have time inshallah, please invite your families and friends as well, so we can all benefit from that program as well inshallah. The, the difference between the meaning or the difference between the virtues and the benefits? The benefits, so is, is it a, when you say Alhamdulillah, we get Aman, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see meaning, it's the same thing about Allah, then we are asking you about what yes. it is. The, the virtues which have been narrated in the hadith, which says that a person will not be questioned or will be held accountable for their food, is the dua, Alhamdulillah, alladhi huwa ashbana, wa arwana, wa ana'ma alayna wa afdala. This dua, the hadith which mentions this, inshallah I can write it down after this as well. The dua, alhamdulillah alladhi atamana wa saqana wa ja'alana min al-muslimin is also proven as it continues that dua that the Prophet always read after eating the food. So there are two separate duas with, with two separate fadail and virtues to itself. اللهم لك الحمد كما أنت أهل وصلي على محمد كما أنت أهل وفل بنا ما أنت أهل فإنك أهل التقوى وأهل المغفرة لا إله إلا الله الحليم الكريم سبحان الله رب الأرش الذيم والحمد لله رب العالمين أسألك موجبات رحمتك وأذائم مغفرتك والغنيمة من كل بر وسلامة من كل إثم لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرت ولا دينا إلا قديت ولا مريضا إلا شفيت ولا هاجة هي لك رضا إلا قديتها ويسرتها يا أرحم الراحمين رب ارحمهما كما رب يعني صغيرة رب ارحمهما كما رب يعني صغيرة وصلى الله على النبي الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومتجمعين آمين برحمتك